everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. I got a sneak preview of participants and where everyone is from um, as of yesterday. And we have participants from 91 countries. So that is just amazing. Um, I am truly honored to be here with you today. Thank you for taking the time to log in and be with us. I know many of you personally, and a lot of you are here really early in the morning or late at night. So my sincere thank you and a shout out to all of our ophthalmic nursing associations around the world that are joining us, so thank you. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Lori Pacheco. I am a registered nurse I'm here in the US. I am certified in ophthalmology. And I come to you wearing two hats. Um, one, I work with Orvis International. Um, their teaching platform, Cybersight, is the platform that we are using today for this webinar. And I'm also a board member for the American Society of Ophthalmic Registered Nurses. So together, ASON and Cybersight bring you this webinar, which we hope will be both educational and inspiring and you know, maybe bring you tips that you can bring back to your own practice. I am going to start first by introducing our speakers today. Let me share screen with everyone. So we have um, all ophthalmic nurses joining us today. First, um, Claudia Dago from Ghana. Nadine Grant McKenzie is from the United Kingdom. Wilson is from Cameroon. Jayona is also from Cameroon. And Ticia Cumberbatch is from Barbados. So hi, everyone, and thank you. Welcome for being with us today sharing your knowledge and your expertise with everyone. Before we get started, I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. So today's webinar, one nursing contact hour has been requested for this activity and nursing contact hours are provided by ASON. Credit contact hours will be denied to any individual who misses more than 10 minutes of the webinar. So make sure you stick around everyone, okay? All attendees must complete a post-evaluation in order to receive credits. Post-evaluations will be emailed to US participants within 24 hours. So please give me a little bit of time, everyone, if you don't mind the patience, um, just you know, give me some time to get those uh, post-evaluations out to you. And if you're outside the US, the certificate of attendance will be available on the site for you. This is the financial disclosures. So as mentioned, I am a volunteer on the board for ASOM and I work full time. Orvis International. And in regards to our speakers, none of our speakers here today have any financial interest or conflicts to disclose. They are presenting voluntarily and we're all very gracious to, uh, to volunteer their time. So thank you. So these are our objectives today. We're going to define global nursing and we're going to describe the roles ophthalmic nurses play in the prevention of ophthalmic disease. Our discussion is going to be on global health. We're gonna talk about disease prevention and patient education as well. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can use that question and answer, that Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. Just type in your question and we're gonna address all questions at the end. I'll try to get to as many as we can, um, time permitted. So please feel free to write in any questions. I got a few of them prior to the webinar that um, we will address as well. So we will do our best to get to everyone. So this is a nice segment into our discussion today, which is a definition of global nursing from the Global Nursing Caucus. And it, it talks about a global nurse and what is global nursing? It's nurses with common global health interests. And that includes everything you see here today. So that's networking, collaboration, it includes training and raising the voices of others, raising the voices of other nurses, and help improve patient outcomes, visibility, advocacy, and quality of care. All this across the globe. I always like to say we're in this together. You know, we, we help each other. A global nurse works together. We raise our voices together for the quality of care for our patients. All right, enough of me talking. Um, Claudia, you want to come on screen, my friend? Hi. So this is my wonderful friend, Claudia. You can go um, off mute, Claudia. There you are. Hi, my friend. Hi, Lori. So Claudia um, and I met in 2019 on an Orbis program to Ghana. She was one of the nurse trainees on our Flying Eye Hospital, and we got to know each other very well, and we kept in touch since then. 
So Claudia is a very dedicated, very motivated ophthalmic nurse, which I am very proud to know. So Claudia, thank you for being with us thank today. You. <laughs> thank you. So Claudia, when you and I chatted before, um, you mentioned to me that ophthalmic nurses in Ghana act as the major patient educator in every setting of eye care in Ghana. And that ophthalmic nurses travel all over the country to deprived and rural areas to give education on eye care and to screen patients and prepare cataract surgery camps. So community outreach, I think, is very important in eye care. So can you tell us a little bit about those outreach programs and what exactly is a surgery camp? Okay, thank you, Lori. So the, uh, the Ghanaian ophthalmic nurse plays a very big role in the prevention of blindness and eye care in general. And one of the major ways we do this is through outreach to patients because we have a lot of areas where eye care is not really accessible. And traveling for the patients traveling to where the hospital is can be a big burden. And some people even have uh, problems with their eye, but they do not know. So one of the, the basis for let me say outreach is uh, delivering eye care in a very efficient way. That is using the list uh, available resources in, in terms of human resource, time, and then the consumables to, live, to deliver care to a wide range of people. So we do this um, by going to the rural areas it could be the school, it could be the whole community, it could be a market setting. And our rangers are educated on eye conditions, on what eye conditions are, because some of them have these eye conditions and they do not know. So, and right. they do not know that patients, pre of assessments of patients, that is visual acuity, uh, fundoscopy, checking of anterior segments prior to uh, the, the, the cataract surgeries and even booking the surgeries for the surgeons. So in areas where there is no ophthalmologist, the ophthalmic nurses do this and then plan with the ophthalmologist on the day the ophthalmologist will visit the place. And during, uh, uh, during the in education, there are so many things that we consider, but emphasis is made on expectation management post-op that you want to let this patient that know that you try as much as possible to help them see but in the course of the surgery there are chances there can be complications there are, there are chances the patient has other underlying conditions that that may impair maybe the vision that the patient may be expecting so this is very important because when you do this Whatever happens post-op, the patient understands. And then we educate them on what, what they should do, like uh, using of medications. Then during the surgery, the, the ophthalmic nurse is responsible for getting of logistics, setting of a theater, uh, organizing the, the whole operation team, circulating, and then the scrub nurses assist during the surgeries. Then post-op, still at the, it could be at the cataract camp or we bring the patients to a teaching hospital or the regional hospital or at the primary eye care to their hospital. Whichever way it is, we either do it at the patients, where the patients live or we bring them over. But at the end of the day, we go to where we go and reach out to the patients. So post-op, you want to let the patients know that they need to use their medications effectively, that surgery is not the only, surgery is just a starting point, mm -hmm. that there's a lot that is expected of them post-operatively. And immediate post-op, immediate post we let them know that when the pad is taken off your eye, you might see very well, or you might not see because the cornea might be hazy. So, these this are things that you emphasize on during, we emphasize on during patient education. Then aside the cataracts, we also have glaucoma patients, people who have been diagnosed of uh, having glaucoma and, and don't really believe it. So 
we, we let them know that um, the management of glaucoma with the medication doesn't really mean that you are going to get your vision improved, but the management is aimed at letting your vision remain where it is so that you don't lose much. It, we also educate during outreach on um, refractive errors in the use of spectacles because in our setting, yeah, when it comes to children, especially in our setting, some parents don't really accept having their kids wearing spectacles, thinking that it can affect them in the future. So as ophthalmic nurses, we get into advising our patients and the parents and telling them that this wouldn't really have any effect on them. And then visual rehabilitation for those who have already lost their vision. In our settings, a lot of people who are the key, pair, the key like family members, those who take care of the, the, the families after having an eye condition and losing their sight, it's like everything ends for the family and this leads to poverty. So it's the role of our ophthalmic nurses, and this is something we really do to let them know that blindness or the loss of your sight is not the end of it all. We refer them to rehabilitation centers and for the kids, they can go to the school of the blind and, and still have education. Thank you, Claudia, that's awesome. Patient education is so big, you know, and, and expectations and giving the right expectations to your patients and, and good patient education so they know what to expect. So thank you. I also know you're interested in advancing your career in ophthalmology and possibly getting certified. Are there any opportunities there in, in Ghana for the advancements in ophthalmic nursing? Well, um, the, the Ghanaian ophthalmic nurse is somebody who has had a training in general nursing, let's say for three years or two years, depending on if it's a BSc or a diploma. And after that, you work for a minimum of three years as a general nurse, as an RN. Then you can go to the ophthalmic school. And uh, the ophthalmic school used to be an advanced diploma, which lasts for one year until 2016, when it was advanced to a BSc and it takes two years. So after the degree in ophthalmic nursing, well, we have some in-hospital in training programs with some partners such as uh, HCB and Orbis, and I have been a beneficiary of that as well. And partners like HCB and Orbis also sponsor some of our nurses to go out of the country for subspecialty programs, lasting maybe six months or three months. But as we speak, there is no structured there is no well-structured pathway for the ophthalmic nurse as regards to education and further career opportunities in Ghana. So ophthalmic nurses have to go for BSc, uh, for a master's program in public, public health or general nursing. But we have something in the pipeline. The Ghana College of Nursing is still discussing that in a couple of years, they want to enroll ophthalmic nurses in a fellowship program where we can have maybe subspecialty courses, but this has not started yet. It's still in a discussion. Thank, Thank you. you, Claudia. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, Laurie. Nadine, are you there? You can come on screen. Hello, Lori. Hi, Nadine. Thank you so much for being here. So, Nadine, Thank you for me. Yep. Sure. Nadine comes to us from London. So, Nadine's primary function is in infection control. And I like to really focus on that because that is a, a very big and very important aspect of what we do in nursing, especially ophthalmic nursing. So, Nadine, can you tell us a little bit about being an infection control nurse and any tips that you may have? for our audience and how best to provide continuing education in infection control and ophthalmology? Okay, so um, first of all, I am a trained ophthalmic nurse. Mm -hmm. Now for, I, I was counting today and I realized it's 20 years since I've done my ophthalmic course. Congratulations. Um, and I've been doing um, 
infection control now for seven years. So the, the most important thing in for us in infection control, especially my role, is surveillance. So it's basically looking at ophthalmic um, post-operative infection within ophthalmology. So as you would know, that's, that's commonly endophthalmitis because that would be something related to procedure, um, surgical procedure or intravitreal injection, something that we actually do. And we need to sort of educate people, i.e. doctors and nurses, because in the UK, um, a significant number of the intravitreal injection are done by nurses. And it's just to um, educate people, make them aware of the potential risk of um, someone having a post-procedure endophthalmitis and the implication that might have on someone's sight. Um, so that is one of the main things. How this information is sent out, we do have um, within the trust, um, in, in the infection control team, we send out a regular newsletter. So on a monthly basis, we'll send out um, what we call a bug brief. And it just basically um, highlights what is currently happening within the organization um, where infection control is concerned. Oh, what I didn't say is that my, my organization is only ophthalmology we do there. So um, everything around uh, my infection control practice is ophthalmology related um, or ophthalmic related. Um, so we send out um, a monthly bug brief and that sort of engage people. So what will happen then? These are displayed in the clinical areas. So individual RFA with what is current um, in infection control. And if there is an outbreak of an ophthalmic, um, most likely endophthalmitis or graft um, or keratitis, anything relating to an infection. It could be national, international, or within our organization. We sort of highlight that so that it can be um, looked for. So for argument's sake, at the moment, one of the things that is quite topical within the country, I, don't, I think it might be wider than the UK, is the relationship between COVID vaccine and um, reactivation of uveitis. So there are a number of patients who have had uveitis um, sort of dormant for a significant number of years. And after they receive their COVID vaccine, then they seem to have a flare up. There is no hard and fast evidence. It's just something that they're currently looking at. So with that information shared by us, it tends to get disseminated and then other institutions around the UK will start look out to see if this is... Um, something that is common within their cohort of, of patients as well. So that is where we, we branch out a bit wider. Um, back to our local um, team, what we do and what I'm not sure everyone do it, but that could help their organization is have a group of champions or what we call them in our trust is um, infection control link practitioners. So within every area within our trust, because we, um, we have like 32 sites across London and the Southeast. So we, have, we, we as infection control nurses could not cover all these sites. So one of the things that we do, we um, have these champions and, and I do regular webinar. Well, now that COVID is happening, is we regular webinar. We used to do workshop, like a half a day workshop and they'll send questions and we'll just update them on what is happening, what is current, and they'll disseminate that throughout their areas. They're the ones also responsible for doing the audits. So we do regular audits, a lot of infection control audits. So you do hand hygiene audit, cleaning audit, um, decontamination. How often the slit lamps are clean? We do spot checks um, to make sure that um, items are clean. We observe staff discreetly to make sure that they decontaminate equipment between patients. So there's a number of things that we are doing to try and minimize and decrease infection in within our ophthalmic um, setting. That's, I love infection control champions. I like that. I'm gonna use that, that's fabulous. Um, a lot of education for your staff as well, I imagine, you know, providing, you know, continuing education for your staff and infection control. Um, are there any requirements in London or where you are by the government to provide a certain amount of infection control training or anything like that? 
Right, so that currently the guidance is that if you are working clinically, so if you're a clinical individual, you must do a refresher um, infection control awareness course every year. If you are a non-clinical staff, so if you're a backroom staff, clerical, then that is every three years. You have okay. to do that, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Yes, here in the, in the US, um, you have to show that you you need an infection control coordinator for your facility, someone like yourself that's in charge of infection control. And you do need to show that that person has been trained and has a certain number of continuing education on infection control each year. So it sounds very similar. Yeah, it's just that they, they, they do it um, online. And what tend to happen is that if you're not 100% compliant with all of your mandatory training, then um, you won't pass your appraisal. And then if you need to get revalidated to practice, that is gonna hinder you. So it, it is in your best interest to make sure that you are compliant with yeah. your um, yeah. mandatory training. Now tell me when a person does, um, unfortunately get an infection like monophthalmitis, um, do you follow that patient? How do you get that information? How, what's the, the process, process of how you get that information? Right, so the process is, um, first thing, the, the patient have their procedure. Um, most time they'll come back to our institution when they start exhibiting sign of um, endophthalmitis. So they'll come in. Um, so we get notified by a few ways. One is once you treat a patient for endophthalmitis, because we do have endophthalmitis protocol for both endogenous and exogenous endophthalmitis. And um, once you get treated, then an incident report, an incident form is generated, they need to complete an incident report form. And then we, um, the infection control team is notified via that way. And as you know, no process is 100% foolproof. So there are people who haven't completed it. However, what I do on a daily basis, and also the microbiologist, we have an external microbiologist who once they receive a vitreous or aqueous specimen, he'll email across to us of any um, findings from that. And also we have a pathology system that we check on a daily basis to see if any specimen is sent to the lab. In case we don't get notified by, via the incident report, we check the specimen. And if there is a specimen, we go into another online um, portal called OpenEye to see why that patient came in and if it is a procedure that the patient did here and if that procedure, when I say here, my word, yes. If the procedure was done within my organization, then what I'll do, I'll look back to see what the procedure was, who did the procedure and, um, and the, the, the general presentation because that patient was treated as an endophthalmitis and then we do a root cause analysis. So we look, we pick it apart, look at the instrument, um, what the ventilation was like in theaters at that time. Um, how many staff were in theaters? Um, is there any commonality between this case of endothelmitis and other cases? Um, if, there are, if that is the case where there is, then we use um, a probability data chart that will put the information in how many cases were done as opposed to how many endothelmitis, and that will determine if that unit should carry on practicing or they should stop and get assessed. Um, we send that notification letter to the surgeon or the nurse who um, did the procedure along with, no, we send the RCA, root cause analysis, with a notification letter to remind that individual that these are the steps that you need to take, i.e. make sure that you clean the patient eye. If the patient has blepharitis, you should postpone surgery. Uh, make sure you use um, povidone iodine on the surface, make it stay for however long. So uh, the notification have that, those are standard. We send that and we request it back within 10 days. And um, once they send that back, we then again look to see um, if, if all the information is there and if we need to share with a wider group of people. But before we do that, we have, we normally, we have an ophthalmologist who is the chairman of the infection control committee who then I di will discuss the case with and they determine that yes, it is a true case of endophthalmitis. And a true case of endophthalmitis in our case doesn't depend on the growth of microorganism, but it's just a clinical presentation because like 40% of endophthalmitis cases do not actually have a growth. 
Nadine, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing that. What such great work you do. Thank you. Thank you. Wilson, come on in. Hello, Lori. Hi, Wilson. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? I am doing great. I seem to get my side to move, so Lawrence is going to have to help me here. Wilson, <laughs> um, you've been doing uh, work that I find absolutely fascinating. Um, you work in the preparation room, um, doing peribulba and retrobulba blocks. Did I hear you say that to me? Yes, um, I work. Tell me, I, tell me about that. I work, okay, fine, thank you. Um, well, I'm Wilson. I'm a certified um, so I work as the head of the operating theater. And as the head of the operating theater, I cover up several units. And one of the units um, where I, I, I practice is a preparation room. And as we all know, um, for us to maintain um, um, the patient calm and quiet during our procedures, we should make sure um, the blocks are properly administered. Mm -hmm. So in our settings, we practice a wide range of um, techniques, among which uh, we have the peribulba blocks, we have the retrobulba blocks, we have the subtenons, we have um, the facial blocks, which we do, and topical blocks. And all of this uh, will depend on, um, on, the, on the recommendations of the surgeon, as well as the clinical um, presentation of the eye or the, 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 the clinical situation of the patient. Mm -hmm. So, um, in our context, um, when the patient comes into the preparation room, the file is assessed. We have to look at the, uh, the most recent um, recommendation from the surgeon. Um, the surgeon may want us to proceed with a retrobulbar block um, um, or a peribulbar. This will depend on how long the surgeon thinks he is going to put um, to realize um, his, his intervention. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we have... Um, 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 difficult, uh, situa difficult conditions such as um, retina surgeries, vitro retina surgeries, which will take um, relatively a very long time, um, we will want to consider going for the retrobulbar and not the peribulbar. And now when we have um, procedures which um, wouldn't last so long, such as cataract surgeries, and um, also taking into consideration the speed of our surgeons, uh, we will want to go for the peribulbar. So, we, if we have patients with um, comorbidities, such as hypertensive patients, already on um, blood thinners, so we wouldn't want to um, create a lot of trauma um, to, the, to blood vessels um, by practicing maybe the peribulbar or the retrobulbar. So we will want to practice the subtenance because the subtenance is less traumatizing mm -hmm. and also we are also faced sometimes with um, some conditions which are not um, invasive um, we will want to consider um, um, the, just the topical, just the topical um, um, applications of um, the anesthetic agent so briefly those are the different techniques um, we, we we do realize and in our context also the, the ophthalmic nurses are trained to realize this um, because in other settings, we will have um, anesthetists do that. But in my country and in our context, we do not have so many of them. So the ophthalmic nurses are, are, are trained to be able to realize this. And also sometimes we could incorporate um, the anesthetic nurses nurse anesthetist also to do that. In my setting, we have a nurse anesthetist who are trained to realize this. And we also have um, the ophthalmic nurses who are also on seat for conditions which are a little bit complicated for them to manage. They will call on the ophthalmic nurses to, to better handle them. So briefly, that is, um, that is what we do in the, in the preparation room preparing the patients for surgery and those are the different techniques which um, we we do implement to make sure our patients are, are calm and our surgeons are comfortable as well oh, thank you that's fascinating yeah here in the us at least in massachusetts um 
actually doing curry bulber or doing blah blah blah, blah at least on our end is is not within our scope we have either anesthesia nurse anesthetists um the surgeon will do it as well so that's fascinating a lot of people having a hard time hearing you wilson so i'm going to have you speak up a little bit if you don't mind um on the next part i wanted to ask you you said you're certified in ophthalmology what's the process of certification where you are like how did you get certified in ophthalmology Okay, um, in a context, um, before being certified in ophthalmology, before being certified in ophthalmology, um, you will have to be a registered nurse first. That is to say, um, three years of training as a general nurse, and thereafter, you will have to practice for at least two years, and um, there is a competitive entrance exam, which, um, is, which, which is launched by by, by the, the, the Ministry of Public Health. And now all the general nurses are invited to, to, to compete. Now those who make it for, <clears throat> make it through the exams um, will enroll for, for, for training, which will last for two years. And thereafter, you are, um, a uh, you are an ophthalmic nurse, but yet about um, other certifications, um, they are not really present in our context, but we have um, the IEG Capo, which um, the nurses in my institution have been introduced to. So we do take um, the IEG Capo, which is um, some of the certifications which um, I have, I'm mm -hmm. a certified ophthalmic assistant. So that is what um, we have um, currently as um, certification programs, but nationally or locally, um, other than um, being um, just being um, uh, an ophthalmic nurse, we okay. don't have other um, certification programs um, okay. present. Okay. Thank you so much, Wilson. Thank you for sharing all that. Okay, thank you. And I okay, you you made mention of the fact that um, maybe in the U.S. we we will have um, the the surgeons do the blocks themselves mm -hmm. or the anesthetists. Yes, in a context, for example, in the day we could do um, at least uh, 30 surgeries. We could go up to maybe 40 sometimes. So sometimes it gets so difficult to have the surgeons do that. Yeah. And so we have to step in to, to make the process um, faster and easier for them. So the, the, the ophthalmic nurses are giving them the necessary tools to know how to go about that. And we also have um, nurse um, anesthetists who are also on site to permit us um, 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 realize the blocks faster so that um, the waiting time is reduced, the surgeons are not so exhausted. And we also help them and assist them to, to, to carry out with their activities in, in, in a better way. That's great. It sounds like your ophthalmic nurses are such a great asset to your facility. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Jayona, come on screen, my friend. Yes, hello, Lauren. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for joining us. I know um, you mentioned to me that you have been doing a lot of outreach activities in response to COVID. Um, that's something I think would be great to share, um, how, you know, how you've been doing these outreach activities and how ophthalmic nurses have stepped up becoming involved in response to COVID in Cameroon. Yeah, um, as uh, like the, those people in Ghana, as Claudia said, uh, outreach program is also available here in uh, Cameroon, and as almost in so many African countries. So for us here in Cameroon, we are doing the outreach activities to respond to the need of the patients who is in the rural area. So during these COVID times, uh, we face uh, challenges and uh, difficulties to make the, uh, to conduct an outreach program, so we put in place uh, such strategies to to adapt the situation of the outreach program activities the, to the COVID response. So what we did here in Cameroon mostly for patients, um, we we do the sanitization as usual, but we just tell them that they have to register uh, ahead of time to the uh, uh, focal point in the uh, rural community. So we just register 100% a day. 
So there, for 200, 200 patients a day, we scattered them as a slot of 50 patients uh, per groups. So we handled 50 patients um, at a time according to the government uh, restriction to gathering people not more than uh, 50 in a one area. But uh, before of that, the one of the team from the hospital go to the field and identify where is the space, which is an open space, not in a closed area area to gather those uh, patients. Then uh, during the process or so, there is a lot of uh, procedure we have to do. We have to install the washing, bucket washing, uh, hand washing with soaps available for patients and staffs to wash their hands regularly. And then uh, instead of using uh, benches for patients to sit, we have to use single chair, seat chair. Uh, just to avoid uh, and respect the social distancing of patients during the waiting time. So uh, as, the, as the policy of the hospital also, we have to show uh, a tissue um, face mask from the hospital and bring them and share to every patient who attend the outreach camp. Because most of those uh, patients from the rural, rural area, they don't have even uh, opportunity to provide themselves a face mask. So the hospital have to provide them a face mask individually, uh, for, which is a handmade from the hospital and sterilized before bringing to the field. So each patient have to be shared one uh, face mask during the camp. Uh, according to the COVID situation also, the staff themselves have to wear a face shield during the consultation proce process. And mostly, uh, as we know, those outreach uh, screening is conducted by the ophthalmic nurses. And then to adapt the situation to the COVID situation, we avoid to use the direct ophthalmoscopy to do the fundus. So we have trained uh, our ophthalmic nurse, nurses to do indirect ophthalmoscopy with the tools which is available with them. Either they use the 10 dub 3 or the 20 dub 3 lenses with a torch if the direct of uh, direct of is not around. Either they use the uh, indirect of itself with the 20 dub 3 uh, volk lens. So this was put in place to respect and identify the disease of the patients uh, in the field. And most of the things also is to, to put in place the the temperature check-in for patients who attend uh, the camps. So all of the patients who attend the camps have to be checked uh, for the temperature, uh, temperature check-in. If they are having high temperature, they immediately send for a general uh, clinical screening to find out if they are not at risk for a COVID situation. Uh, one of the things I saw, which is uh, an innovation we in introduced to the field, I saw the use of the portable slit lamp using the smartphone, which is the remedio uh, from India. So we imported slit lamps ad adapted with a smartphone. At that time, uh, the ophthalmic nurses who screen the patients that does not to put their heads on the portable slit lamp, but just adopt the, the smartphone on that slit lamp so that they can see all of the, in, the abnormality on the eyes on the screen of the smartphone. So that is some of the innovation we adopted for the outreach program during the COVID time uh, here in Cameroon. Wow, that's fascinating. That's, that's great work, thank you. You know, I noticed that you have your COA um, certification. Can I ask, it, do many nurses in um, Cameroon go and get their COA or COT before becoming a nurse? Or is that something that you did while, you know, while you were in there? Did you do it before or after? Uh, normally, as Wilson said before, um, nurses is uh, comes as a general nurse in the field. So 
after practicing, uh, what we do here in our own hospital is to enroll uh, our own nurses, uh, which have been uh, as a general nurse, to do the certified ophthalmic assistant program with the IGCAPO. Up to now, we are just uh, uh, as a uh, starting program to uh, end at uh, certified ophthalmic assistant. We are looking uh, in a way how to bring them up to certified ophthalmic te technician. Mm -hmm. But uh, the program is not yet set with the IGCAPO uh, office, head office in US. So we are trying to find a way how to put it in place. But uh, as Wilson said as well, um, mostly uh, there is already the ophthalmic nursing uh, school, well, which is uh, heading by the government here in Cameroon, like uh, in every other countries uh, in Africa. So this program is for two years. So they are running in that uh, area for to do uh, ophthalmic nursing. But now it's also available in South Africa and in London, the uh, school for the master of public health. So most of the ophthalmic nurses applied if they want to get involved in public uh, health to go to the uh, London school or in uh, school in the uh, University of Cape Town in South Africa. So if they want to Pro, uh, have an, another career as administrator or coordinator of the programs, they, they'll be enrolled in those uh, eye care uh, public health program. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks for all that information. Yeah, you are welcome. Last but certainly not least is Tissia. Tissia, you on? Hi, Laurie. Hi, Tissia. Welcome. Thank you. So Tissia is an ophthalmic nurse in Barbados, but please note that Tissia is the first and only certified ophthalmic registered nurse in Barbados. So Tissia, I think you are a great inspiration for, um, for ophthalmic nurses um, here and in Barbados. And I'd love you to share your journey of what it was like to get certified and any tips that you can provide our ophthalmic nurses who are considering Becoming certified, something that maybe they can they can utilize in their own uh, in their own practice and their own lives. Okay, no problem. If you don't mind, I will start from where I came into the ophthalmology in two thousand and six. Please do. I didn't choose ophthalmology, but it was chosen for me after I had medical illness. I was sent to an area that had nursing care, but it was a cleaner environment. After I got there, I had this, this desire. I wanted to understand what was going on with the eye patients. And I started doing my own reading and research. And I would ask some of the doctors if they knew anything about nursing certification. I was not pointed in the direction of nursing certification, but I became a COA, a certified ophthalmic assistant because that was the programs that our surgeons were aware of. I did that particular certification in 2014. But we have this thing called OSWI, which is the Ophthalmological Society of the West Indies. We have a yearly conference in the Caribbean. And for the one that was held in Barbados, which was the one that had the first nursing symposium we had the opportunity to hear about a certified registered nurse in ophthalmology certification. That's when we were introduced to it. This was 2016. And I had a few years of procrastination, but in 2018, after Arbis came to Barbados to do a mission here, we had the opportunity to be reintroduced to this CRNO certification. The first week of the Orbis mission, the nurses would have spent time doing certification courses. And we had to do two tests, one before, one after. And each time I scored decent, I scored well. And I was encouraged by the facilitators to, you know, don't, don't let the fire die. Don't go procrastinating again, pursue the certification. 
So that was in May of 2018. And in September, I went on to do the certification examination. It's not available here locally, but I would have gone to Canada to do the certification. What I would say to persons who are considering certification, I would say go for it. It's a boost to your confidence because the, the preparation is grueling. It's one where you have to do a whole lot of reading. And the more you read, the more educated you become, the better you are able to advise your patients. And as well as when the doctors are speaking, you, you don't feel lost. You are, you are fully aware of what they're talking. Well, I shouldn't say fully aware. You have a better understanding of what they're saying. So certification to help nurses in boosting their confidence. Wow. Tissy, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's wonderful. I and mean, tell me more. Yes, oh, please. One second. Um, I didn't get a chance to update you, but since we spoke class, one other person in Barbados became certified. Yay. Yeah. So we wonderful. have two. We have two certified registered nurses in ophthalmology here in Barbados. That's wonderful. So if a nurse comes along and says they don't think they can do it, they're not sure, you know, what it's going to take, and what what would you tell them? What what inspiration can you give them? I won't be able to, I won't lie. I would say it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. It would call for you to get the, the resources and it's certain if you choose that particular examination to certify with, they have plenty of publications out there to help, help you. And I use my books up to this week. We have a new nurse to the unit I was able to go to the, the, the one on office procedures and look there and show her about doing visual acuity the correct way and the rationales for doing it. ASORN has plenty of information out there to, to help. And then there are other certification exams out there if you choose not to do the ASORN one and just go for it. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it in the end. That's awesome, thank you. Now everyone has been sharing what they do in their in their country for work and, and what their scope of practice looks like. So I wanna give you the opportunity to share with us as well. What, what do you do in Barbados as an ophthalmic nurse? I, as an ophthalmic nurse, and I work in the eye clinic and I do a preoperative assessment clinic. There I would interview the patients, take their history using the ophthalmic assistant certification. I do biometries and their care readings and everything and prep for cataract surgery. I do a lot of education, not just for the patients, but for staff as well. I have the opportunity even this evening to be able to do a presentation to culminate Nurses Week on glaucoma this evening, but I would have done other, other public lectures as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for all the information that you've given us. And this is great. This is right on time. And it allows us to answer um, some questions. If anyone has any questions for any of our panels, please feel free to write it in the QA. I do see we have some in here and we can certainly do our best to answer. I did want to answer one question that came prior to um, today that they had put in the registration. And the question is, what are the tips you can um, provide to other ophthalmic nurses to help them enjoy their work? And I thought that was something for sure to, to reach out and to say, you know, I know for myself personally, I love what I do. I love being an ophthalmic nurse. Um, but one of the things that contributes to that is constantly learning. And I think something very important that I've had the opportunity to do is to work in different areas of ophthalmic nursing. If you have that opportunity to do that, surgical nursing is primarily my background, but I work in clinic for two years. Uh, if somebody calls out sick, I work in preoperative recovery room, uh, sterile processing. I've had just wonderful opportunities to kind of move around a little bit and it really helps keep it fresh, it keeps me learning. It also gives you a great appreciation for what your peers do and what other nurses do and how they contribute um, towards patient care. 
Um, would anyone like to jump in? Any of our nurses here like to jump in? How do you, what would you say to a nurse to help them enjoy their work and help them love what they do? Anyone want to jump? Nadine or Tissia, you want to share? Um, for me, um, what I have done is I've been in ophthalmic nursing for a long time because I was trained originally in Jamaica and I came to the UK. Um, I did ophthalmic in Jamaica and I've been doing ophthalmic here as well. And what tend to happen is that sometimes you might get sort of bored doing one thing. Um, you, there is so many scopes that you can go in ophthalmic because I've since I've join my trust I have done day surgery I've done anesthetic I've done recovery I've j I'm telling you the scope is endless and yeah. um and now okay. I don't know whomever have certain things in their country such as advanced practitioners intravitreal injection mm -hmm. some people do lumps and bumps so there's so many other scopes so don't get bogged down and bored with one, you can always go somewhere else in ophthalmology because there's a lot of areas. Exactly, I agree. Very good. And adding on to what Nadine was saying, yes, the scope is endless. I, at this point in time, I'm not even sure where I want to go next. Do I go in the direction of nurse, administrator, or do I do just education? But I also have the interest in the clinical side and I don't have as much experience as Nadine has and like some of the others, but it really is good to hear that there are opportunities out there because they're not available on my island doesn't mean that they're not available. So I think that if people get to realize that ophthalmology is not stagnant and it's, you know, it's fluid, people would be really interested in what we do as ophthalmic nurses. That's so great, thank you. Claudia, I got a question here for you. Someone asked if you are doing ECCEs where you are, or if you're doing FACOs um, in your cataract um, programs. Are you uh, are you able to come on, Claudia? If not, we can move. Yes, there she is. Hello. Hi, Claudia. Hello. Okay. So, so stay, um, yeah. So we are doing. FACOs and SICS alongside, but most of our outreach cases are SICS. Okay, so many of you, some in the U.S. may not know what SICS, that is small incision cataract <laughs> surgery, a little similar to... We, um, do, we do FACOs in the hospital settings, especially the tertiary institution. Uh, do you do um, IOP checks as well as part of your pre-op? Uh, do the nurses do the IOP uh, pressure checks? Both nurses and doctors do. Okay. Even on outreach basis, sometimes we take the portable tonometers, the tonopens, and the packings to do that. Okay. I do have some questions here on certification. Um, if you don't have an ophthalmic nursing association in your area to reach out to, I'm going to give you my information towards the end, and I'm happy to help you find a nursing organization and see what I can do to help you advance in your ophthalmic um, nursing uh, career. So uh, many of the questions that you have in regards to certification or just advancing your career, I'm happy to, to help you after the webinar. Uh, let's see. I know one another question that came up was um, ophthalmic associations. And, you know, um, are there many around the globe? and I do believe last time I checked, it was 12 ophthalmic nursing associations, but the Philippines, uh, I've been speaking with a physician in the Philippines lately, and just either last year or the year before, they put together their first ophthalmic nursing association. So very excited for them. I believe they make 13. So last time I checked, we had 13 ophthalmic nursing associations around the globe. And the question was how many in Africa? I believe there are five in Africa. Uh, let's see here. Uh -huh. I think we may have answered all of our questions. There's some information here from some of our nurses in the Flying Eye Hospital as well on infection control. Um, a lot of questions on ophthalmic nursing and how to get certified. 
what is the difference between CRNO and RN in terms of their roles and responsibilities in the eye hospital? Tissia, as a CRNO, did that change your roles um, and responsibilities? Not really, yeah. because yes, I work in the eye clinic, so it didn't really change my roles. I got more responsibilities because <laughs> then I'm the one who gets to do a lot of teaching and persons look up to me because of the certification. But there are others who can function as well within the department without the certification. But like I told you earlier, being certified boosts your confidence and you know that what you're seeing is the correct thing and it's on paper versus exactly. just doing it because somebody told you to do it. Exactly. I got certified because I, I you know, ophthalmology is all I've ever wanted to do and it's all I want to do. So it seems right to me. Um, most nurses I speak to as well, it's their way of saying, this is what I love to do and I want to do my best in it and I want to learn and do as much as I can and they want on to get certified. So thank you. Um, very educational and great to hear what each everyone is doing. So just reach, many people are reaching out saying thank you for this educational um, talk. Let's see. Do any of the nurses do imaging, OCT, angiography? I believe, I don't remember if it was Jayona or Wilson that does. Jayona, was it you that did your OCT in, in uh, biometry or was it Wilson? Yes, um, Laurie, I, mm -hmm. I, do, I do OCTs, biometry, okay. um, and B scans, and fundus photographies. Okay, you do the fundus photographs. Uh, okay, and they were asking about fluorescent angiogram. Any, any of the panelists, any of you nurses do um, FAs, fluorescent angiograms? Do you assist with FAs in clinics? No? Okay, some of our nurses um, here in the US do that as well. They work directly with diagnostics and they'll, we get a lot of IV nurses that will come in and do fluorescent angiograms. Um, infection control training in Nigeria. Can someone have access to any of infection control training? So Nadine, any suggestions on infection control training? If somebody, not necessarily where you're from, but in other areas, any tips of where they can gain access to infection control training? They, um, there's, um, you can tip, tap into WHO, not WHO, um, WHO. So they will have, and if, if you have access to CDC, because most of the, the places that do, um, and your country should have an infection control body. So you should be able to get some information there. But that should be something that is within every organization because it's sort of mandatory. So it's just to find out where you can get that information within your, your trust or your hospital. Thank you. Question if anyone is aware of ophthalmic nurses actually performing cataract surgery. I am not, not in the US. That, I don't believe that falls within our scope of practice. Are any of our nurses aware of ophthalmic nurses actually performing surgery in any of your countries or anything that you're aware of? Yes. Claudia? Yes, in Ghana, but it, um, it used to be before. We, we used to have ophthalmic nurses going to Gambia for a training on cataract surgery. So I think we still have a couple of them. Wow, really? I wasn't aware of that. That's uh, that's fascinating. So the nurses themselves actually perform the procedures? Yes, they do. Wow, thank you. Thank you for that. But I think that. that training has stopped. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the Gambia still trained the cataract surgery for nurses. So, uh, because I'm in touch of some of them in the Gambia, so they are still doing the training for nurses for doing cataract surgery. But in Malawi, uh, they have stopped, and maybe in Kenya also, because Kenya also trained uh, some uh, ophthalmic nurses to do cataract surgeries. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yes Laurie, I wish to add something about that. And sure. now, Ophthalmic nurses are trained um, as cataract surgeons, mostly in areas where you have no ophthalmology, no, no ophthalmologist. Yes, for example, in Cameroon, we have areas where you wouldn't find an ophthalmologist. So the ophthalmic nurses, they go for, the, for, for, for such trainings 
and when there is no ophthalmologist, then they could practice. But it's something that is already getting um, outdated. So um, I think now the ophthalmologists are coming up and at least you, we can find an ophthalmologist in every region and it's getting better. So the, the ophthalmic nurses are no longer getting into that so much these days. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. And I see here Gambia nurses also do cataract surgery. So I find that that absolutely um, fascinating. You guys, it's 10 o'clock, we're right on time. Thank you. Um, Lawrence, we're gonna to go to the next slide. I just wanna share with everyone my contact information. Um, some of the questions were about just how to help advance their nurse, nursing careers in ophthalmology. And I'm more than happy to help you. And if you have any questions for any of our nurses here, I'm certain I can uh, help you get in contact with them. Take a pic of my, of my contact, write it down. And please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart for being here. All these nurses, everyone here, all our participants, as well as all our panel nurses, you guys are all an inspiration to everyone. And I thank you for sharing all your information. I hope the information we provided today just can help you in your practice and help you grow as an ophthalmic nurse. So thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe and be well. Thank, thank you, Lori.